and pending boom in mobile technology, Alex formed a company with the core goal of implementing mobile marketing strategies focused on specific industries, with real estate as the primary focus. By building a team of industry partners, mobile development experts, and a passionate sales force, Alex created one of the premier mobile technology firms in North America. His buddy Warren Dow is the vice president and co-owner of Barcode Publicity, originally focused on lab-based technology with a degree in neuroscience from Brown University, Warren branched into the world of high security communications for a major consulting firm. Acting as the director of client relations, Warren was exposed to many enterprise-level systems focused around a stationary user. I don't know what that means, so hopefully Warren will explain to us. This experience motivated Warren to focus on developing mobile systems and mobile access to traditionally immobile technologies. And he hasn't looked back since, becoming a part of Barco. Please welcome Warren and Alex. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Warren Dow. This is Alex Camillo. Hey, um, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, as, as she stated, I'm the Vice President of Barco Publicity. We uh, provide mobiles, mobile marketing strategy services. So that can be everything from mobile websites, mobile applications. Uh, but where we started out was in strategy. How do we get uh, this, this impending boom, as uh, Alex has introduced, this impending boom of mobile technology and these mobile consumers, how do you get that information? How do you relay what you have to not only your members, who are also mobile, but their consumers as well. So that, that's really where we focus. And just as a perfect example, uh, we were trying to set up this PowerPoint presentation a few minutes ago, and I said, well, yeah, do you have something that I can advance the slides with? They said, oh, we couldn't figure it out this morning. So in about five minutes, Alex and I downloaded uh, an app to my phone, so now I can control no way. This presentation. Wow. No way. Yeah. Yeah. Directly through here. That's amazing. So, you know, it's it's not only about um, it's not only about efficiency in being able to do my job while I'm on the road, but it's also about well, in this situation, being able to get my point across to you. This mobile technology is making it possible for me to now communicate with you. So hopefully. The, the first part of this, we're going to spend about 30 minutes going over just the changes in mobile uh, consumer behavior. What's changing? What's the difference between a desktop user and somebody who's on their smartphone or their tablet? So before I get started, how many of you in the room currently have a cell phone? Thank you very much. Okay. And of all of you that have a cell phone, how many of you have a smartphone? Sure. I, it's sort of I'm smart. I'm Blackberry. I'm not sure. Why is that smarter? But no. I, my, it's, it's almost smarter. I'm, 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 it's, it's I'm, I'm a C student. Um, well, yeah, you're getting C plus. <laughs> yeah, but there's no hope here. <laughs> so, and um, just out of curiosity, which doesn't really have any bearing, how many of you have iPhones? And how many of you have Android? Okay, so it's actually a pretty good split. Uh, right now, about 53% of smartphone users have Android, and 35% have iPhones. Uh, if we asked that same, that same stat a year ago, was exactly the opposite. It was 53% iPhone and 35% uh, Android. So the market is constantly changing, and that means that you also need to understand how those changes affect the information that you put out there. For instance, do I, do I create an application or do I put out a mobile website? Well, if you put out an application, do you put out an iPhone app? Do you put out an Android app? Do you put out both? And these are some of the things that we'll be talking about today. So just to use this dongle on here, uh, we're going to start out talking about mobile trends and usage, who your mobile users are, um, what's changed in their behavior, and how different types of devices are being used. Um, so. To start out, this is a stat from 2010-2011, and they estimated that by 2013, more people will use their mobile phones uh, than PCs to get online. Google is estimating that over 50% of all web traffic by the end of this year is going to be mobile. Now, 
while we sit here today, that's 40% of all web traffic. Orig uh, all web traffic. We're not talking about initial searches. We're just talking about all web traffic, 40%. That's a staggering number. because, And that means that by the end of this year, that primary way people are going to be communicating with you and with your members' businesses is through their mobile device. In fact, 65% of all searches, web searches, start on smartphones. When people get home, they'll continue those searches, more complex tasks, and I'll explain that in a little bit as well. Now, mobile search has grown by, two, by 4x by 2010. Now, this is what they were saying last year. This number is not a, a proportionate rate. This is an exponential growth. It's now over 16x what it was in 2010. Mobile search is just, it's changing the way that people are interacting with the world, with each other, and most importantly, with businesses. And this last stat, there will be one mobile device for every person on Earth by 2015. Seven billion devices by 2015. That's, that's incredible. And really what, what we have to thank for that is the U.S. ended up have, we have a physical infrastructure. Internet was put down on hard lines before it went to 3G and 4G access. Well, in a lot of countries, they realized how expensive that was. And so in a lot of these developing countries, they just went straight to 4G access. So most people don't sit at home with a laptop. They have a smartphone. They have a tablet. That's the way that they're getting their internet access. So, 70% of mobile users compare product prices on their cell phones. 65% read product reviews on their phones, and 50% of these mobile searches lead to purchase. This is, this is very important, because it's all about how they're getting that information. Not only what information is out there, but the format of that information so that they can easily interact with that information. Um, if somebody has to, uh, how many of you have zoomed in, or gone to a website on your phone, and had to zoom in, and scroll around, couldn't read a word on it? I, I imagine everybody in here. Did you go back to that site afterwards? Why would you? You can't use it. And so those are, the, those are the sort of things that you take into account when you're building a mobile presence. Now today we're not going to talk about the development of that mobile presence. We're just going to give you some stats and under, so that you understand really how the world is changing and we would be more than happy to talk to you afterwards or talk to your members um, about ways that they can implement mobile strategies for their own businesses. But for the sake of time today, uh, the second presentation is going to be about the Google environment and leveraging that for business efficiency um, because Google is a great mobility tool. So, 95% of smartphone users have searched for local information. How often do you, are you on your smartphone looking for something that's 300 miles away? You're not. You're looking for the closest gas station. You're looking for a pizza place that's around the corner. People are looking for local information. 61% uh, of users will call a business after searching, and 59% will visit the location, and 90% of these people act within 24 hours. Mobile users are not only lazy, but they're impatient. <laughs> they want information to get to them quickly, and they want you to be able to react to, uh, to their inquiries, their questions, their calls in a very fast-paced form. Um, this 95% looking for local information, this is really helpful for you too because search engines are <coughs> will prioritize mobile searches. When you do a search from your smartphone and you do a search from your desktop computer, they'll end up getting different results. Now I guess many of them will be overlapping, but the algorithms <coughs> excuse me, that uh, Google and these other search engines use for mobile devices will prioritize site uh, will prioritize local businesses as opposed to desktop <coughs> searches which don't necessarily focus on so, how do you increase your presence on when someone does a search? This one helps. You know, how do you, you take that to get up to the same? We, well, we'll talk about that when we get to the Google presentation. Um, honestly, that's a whole presentation in itself. How, how can you get better presence on the web? And that, that's something that our, our company does. Um, See, I get spam advertisements for me, you know, let me get you in there, but I'm a little, you know, yeah, you should be hesitant. Uh, any, 
any company that promises you, you know, a number one ranking or a first page result, they're, they're lying to you. There's nothing that they can do to guarantee anything. And, that, and that's really important when you're uh, trying to understand how search engines work. Their algorithms, they have over 120 points that they analyze. And maybe Alex would talk about that a little bit when we get to Google. Um, but it's constantly changing, too. They prioritize some things. They weight it differently. And, and how they change that will affect your rankings. Uh, so getting that presence, it's very content-driven. Uh, content will always be king, but uh, it's also the way that it's reported to the search engine so they know how to search the information, that content that you put out there. So who is mobile? This is just trying to give you a general understanding of what type of people or what age groups are using smartphones versus mobile um, devices. Now this is back from 2010. And the reason I'm bringing this, I'm bringing some older stats into this is these numbers have grown significantly. Yet the demographics have stayed relatively consistent. Um, so we, how many people in here just have don't have a smartphone, just a regular flip phone? Okay, just just curious. Um, all right, so as we can see, the, the main uh, age groups, the demographics, are from 18 to 54. Now, with home building, uh, what's your average age of a uh, home buyer, somebody who's going to be purchasing one of these constructions, these new constructions? 30, 30 to 35? No. no. Oh, no. Varies on income. Varies on income. Varies on income. So, like, the rebuyers are usually, you know, second home buyers are 45 to 54, even 55 to 64. They're moving up. The first time buyers are your younger time. Now, they're not going to buy new construction to buy Absolutely. And in real estate, the average age is about 32, 32, 33. Uh, we work very heavily in the real estate industry. I was just curious about new construction because we don't necessarily work in this industry very frequently. So, it, it varies. Okay, fair enough. Um, so just to continue moving on, these age uh, ranges, it also varies in ha uh, who has their smartphones um, by eight or by income levels. And so as you can see, uh, the hot people who are making 100000 or more across the board uh, are going to be the largest group that are going to be using smartphones, whether that's because their business requires them to be interacting with it on a, uh, on a regular basis. But these are the people that you want to target. People who have these smartphones are the people who uh, are also going to be using it to be looking up your information. And we'll talk about this phrase at the end of my presentation. It's called found time. Now, how many of you throughout the day have been on your smartphone looking up, uh, looking at your emails in your free time while you're at this conference? I imagine everybody here. Now, consumers tend to use that free time, whether it's waiting for a bus, waiting for a train, whether they're at a red light, we hope that they're not using it, but we all have, let's be honest. Um, it's all about being able to find that time to interact, and when you do interact, making sure that that, that information is easy enough that they don't have to spend more than 20 seconds just to be able to start using your information or looking at that information. So, 60% of users expect a mobile site to load within three seconds or less. Now, this goes to, in the development of a mobile presence, if you think that you can put your existing website on a smartphone, and exactly what I was saying before, zooming in and scrolling around, the images that tend to be on desktop sites are too large to load within three seconds. Those, those pages will normally take 30, 40, 50 seconds. Now, would you wait? For that to load? Probably not. And in fact, 71% expect it to load as fast as a desktop, and 78% will only try it two times or less. And if it doesn't load within this three to five seconds, um, which is the 71%, three to five seconds, they're gone. So that, that's a very important uh, piece of information because you obviously can't leave out this mobile demographic. This is a very important one for your business and your members' businesses. Now, there's been a debate going on for years. Um, it started about five years ago when mobile really started taking off. Uh, do you go with an, uh, an application or do you go with a mobile website? Now, applications are, are great, they stay on your phone, but it's harder to get found in the first place. 
And so mobile websites have become the primary tool of interacting with mobile consumers. In fact, 81% of consumers prefer using mobile websites over applications uh, uh, for researching uh, prices. Now, why is that? It's because they expect, they think that with an application they're only getting a single source of data. Now, appearances are everything. When you go to Google and you do a search and you get a whole set of results and you click on one of those websites, you're getting information from it, it's still a single source of information. But the consumer believes that they have the choice of what set of information they're getting. Uh, as opposed to with the apps, if I go to the app store and I have 20 apps I have to download to then be able to search through them, it doesn't give you that same feeling of choice. So 81% uh, mobile websites are the primary key, but applications are very important for client retention making sure that people can come back to your site easily. Now, every industry is different with what information gets put on those mobile sites and, what, um, and applications. Sometimes it's going to be uh, regulatory information. Maybe it's new building codes that you want to make sure all of your members have access to. Um, sometimes it's the actual homes that your clients have uh, or the new constructions that they've done, the, uh, the towns that they do business in. There's all sorts of things to take into account, with, but every industry is different with the information that's on it. But what stays the same and is consistent across all industries is that they prefer mobile websites over applications. Applications are about client retention. 79% prefer mobile sites for product reviews, and 63% prefer mobile sites for purchasing. I fall within the 37. If I'm going to buy something, I'd rather do it through an app because I trust that one app. Exactly the opposite of why consumers don't want to start the process there. I trust that single source when I'm ready to make the purchase. It all depends. Every, these are, this is just a numbers game at the end of the day. So why is it so important to go mobile? Well, 57% of businesses will not, or I'm sorry, consumers will not recommend a business with a bad mobile website. If you go to a company's site from your phone and you can't use it, are you, you're probably not going to recommend it. But more importantly, when you get, it's unlikely that you're going to go back to their site when you get home. Mobile users are lazy and they're impatient. And that's not a bad thing, it's just something that you have to understand. Um, I'm sure you might even define yourself as an impatient person when you're on your smartphone. But being able to, uh, to get access to that information when I want it, if I can't, why would I ever recommend that business? Why would I? It's not on the top of my mind when I get home. It's on my mind right now, so I want it right now. 40% of uh, consumers will turn to a competitor's website immediately after having had a bad mobile experience. If I can't get the information I want right now from you, I can get it from your competitor. Now, in some markets, that's not always the case. Uh, but in general, these are the numbers. And this last stat, 23% of adults have cursed at their phone when a site doesn't work. The other 77 are lying. That's true, exactly. I, 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 I definitely fall within those 23% to make sure all of you can sympathize with that. So, now, just to understand different types of devices, um, and the marketing efforts that you're putting out there. Now, every industry and every market is a little bit different, but um, across the board, 90% of all of our media interactions are screen-based, which means 10% are using traditional marketing or offline media. Um, so radio, newspaper, magazines. The important thing to take out of this is, well, obviously a digital presence is almost necessary today, and as we start talking about mobility, um, you know, making sure that mobile presence is out there. But for this 10%, now how many of you advertise in local newspapers or magazines on the radio? Do you have a way for them to connect to your digital presence? We have a QR code. Excellent. QR codes are, are a really great tool. Um, they're, they're coming out with all sorts of different tools that you can use. Near field communication, they have text codes. They, there are lots of different marketing tools that you can use. But whatever you do with your offline uh, publication, your offline marketing, you need to make sure that there's a bridge to your digital content because that's where people are going to get that information. They read your stuff, they'll go to check out your website. 
they'll find your ad, they'll check out your website. And as shallow as it is sometimes, aesthetics are very important. People want to see something that they feel comfortable with. Before they'll give away their contact information, before they'll contact you, they want to feel comfortable with you. They want to, make, they want to feel that you're professional. And so the website, the look and feel of your website is often very important in that whole process. Okay, can I ask a question here? Sure. Um, I have a, I have a, a Y staffer who does our communications. We had a QR code conversation on Monday. And she said, I have never used access to QR code. My generation does not access QR codes. How old is she? 26 or 27. So, I'm, so that's my question. What is that just that individual or is that a, 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 is that a across the board? So, you know. It's a great question. Um, and it doesn't matter what the industry is, it doesn't matter what the age group is, it's all about uh, how you market it as well. For instance, we have a website called drbarcode.com, drbarcode.com. When our clients use QR codes, we always suggest add a tagline right beneath the QR code that says, learn to scan at drbarcode.com. Because when you go to that website, from your mobile device, it will automatically recognize your device and send you to the best barcode scanner or QR code scanner in your phone's marketplace. Now, not everybody knows how to scan a QR code. I was talking to some realtors the other day, um, and they said, well, do I just take a picture with my phone? And uh, no, you, you have to actually have an application. Um, I find that as these major brands, uh, Home Depot started putting QR codes on every single one of their products, their goal was to reduce the amount of support that they needed throughout the store. So people can go in, they scan the QR code, it gives them all of the product information right there. It's all about the utilization, the execution of using those QR codes. So for instance, another thing. Well, can uh, you tell us how to do that then? Why you're on the I think it's a, if you go to the so website, drbarcode, it's a website, not an application. Uh, so drbarcode.com. It will recognize your device and send you to the best free QR code scanner. I think phone technology has changed too in the last just in a year and a half. Sure. That smartphones and everything, you know, were starting to come out weren't as sophisticated as they are now, and, you, and as users were trying to use QR codes when they when they scan them, they couldn't find anything because the phone wasn't advanced enough to do it. And so, that, and that tends to be the the actual phone or the application as opposed right. to the phone. In Japan, it took off. They, it was developed back in 1994 by Denso Wave Corporation. They, uh, they're one of the supply chain management firms associated with Toyota. And they developed the code for streamlined processing of auto part ordering. They wanted to make sure that anytime somebody used a part, they scanned it out. So that way it would automatically order parts. There was no person that had to be responsible for it. They had a utilization that then it boomed in Japan. Not because it was that consumers couldn't understand it. It was because their cell phones have lower, or they have like no radiation emission standards there. So their phones in Japan were able to have better quality cameras and were able to scan the QR code much sooner. Then Europe came and then the US. The US has the highest radiation emission standards, which is good, so we don't all have phone-sized tumors on the side of our head. But, um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I guess, um, but it's, it's, there's a lot of factors that go into it. Another thing to take into account using QR codes is for every one inch by one inch a QR code is, you can, you can be a foot away. So realtors who put them on sign riders or in front of houses, well, the average distance from a sign rider to the curb is eight feet in America. Average distance. So if you have a QR code less than eight inches by eight inches, that person still has to get out of the car. So people say, oh, well, the QR codes aren't working for me. First question, do you have a way to track them? Oh, no, how do you track QR codes? Well, how do you know they're not working for you? Well, I guess I don't. Second question, well, how are you using them? How big are your QR codes, and how far are they from the consumer? Oh, they're three inches by three inches, and you're eight feet away? Well, yeah, of course, no wonder it's not working for you. We have clients in Denver that put a 10 foot by 10 foot QR code on, on a billboard. And you can scan it from 120 feet away. So we hope they're not doing it when people are driving. We really hope, but we just stay out of that. <laughs>
So, so getting back to my question about the 26 and 27 year olds using QR I use them all the time. I use them all the time. I'm just, I'm just asking. That's all. We use them on our fest. We do a scatter block festival home. Um, so we have 42 sites. So you know, we have a QR code on our signs that are eight inches. Right. On the on the on the, on the roadside yeah. signs, they can click it. It automatically tells you where you're at, where the next, where the closest communities are to go visit you. You know, we also have the text for those people who don't use a QR. Sure. We have text and text and that, so they have their option of which one's more logical. But it directs them all to the, where to go. Gives them the you know, then you can download. It'll give you sure. GPS to tell you where to have drive directions. And that that's so a very have, well thought through marketing strategy. It costs right. sixteen thousand dollars to do, but it's the best sixteen thousand dollars we ever spent versus twenty five at the post of that, which was worthless. I, I have to say it's sixteen thousand dollars well spent, but had you known us earlier, it wouldn't cost me nearly as much. We may be talking about this. I may be talking about this. One thing that I think will really sort of direct to your question on usage um, is is Warren's point about tracking, about people tracking these QR codes. Uh, I had a very similar situation where at an event, and um, I sort of walk up to a group afterwards, and there's a whole discussion around a table very similar. Well, I don't use them, my age group doesn't use them, on and on and on and on. And I walk up to this group and I said, raise your hand if you track them. Nobody raised their hand. And I went, well then what are you basing anything on? And they went, well I don't know. I said, well I track them, and across yeah. everybody we do this for, we see about 8 to 10 percent of website traffic, of their mobile website traffic coming from those QR codes. So sure, is it going to do as much as search engines? Probably not. Is it going to be as much as somebody typing in a web address? Web address? Probably not. But 8 to 10 percent of your overall traffic is nothing to scoff at in terms of you know, driving people to that content. So uh, you know, it's definitely worth doing. And one other thing about using them is action items. Everyone puts them on their marketing, and that's great. It's really awesome that you put them on your marketing. But say, scan this for information on. Yeah. Yeah. Scan this to get. Because if I don't know what I'm going to get to, and it's not, a, I don't know if it's a mobile site, or I don't know if it's this or that, I'm probably not going to. But if it says, hey, scan this for more information about, and I go, wow, I want more information about that, I'm absolutely going to scan it. So a lot of it has to do with implementation beyond just sort of, you know, do people scan them in general, and the tracking really helps. And I, it doesn't really necessarily matter to you. My 30 year old, my two 30 year olds that use it, I used it at IBS religiously because I'm looking for personal products to build a house, and I was scanning items that I wanted information to be able to save and look back, look at later without getting the mail piece, so. <laughs> I we use them. Way. I'm just simply passing on a conversation that sure. we had. Yeah. We do use them, and I use them. But I was just curious: is this trend fading? Doesn't sound like it. You know, it is something replacing QR codes that is the next generation that's cutting edge. There, there will know. be a next generation. <laughs> I mean, text codes were there, then QR codes became bigger in the U.S. as cameras got better, um, which now pretty much every smartphone can scan a QR code, even Blackberries. Yeah. And. <laughs> and uh, but the next generation is near field communication. Is what? Near field communication. And uh, that it's not going to be around in every device. Right now it's in Android devices, the Samsung uh, Samsung Galaxy S3s, the new Notes, they have them. iPhone did not put in a near field communication receiver. They don't have that built into it yet. Hopefully the next generation does. But what that is is just a little chip. So I don't even have to open an app to do it. I can just wave my phone over it, um, and it, it'll send you exactly how a QR code does to a specific page or a specific, or even your home page, whatever you want it to do. But that near field communication tag can do the exact same thing with less interaction. And the goal is making it easier and easier and easier right, for right. consumers to get that information. Right. right now, it's also cost prohibitive. And the reality is, a, a mobile marketing uh, presentation, I could probably talk for two or three hours just on different tools and how you could utilize them. And uh, maybe coming out of this, uh, I don't know what information is going to be valuable for you, hopefully a lot of this, but we also do presentations, uh, a lot of presentation services. So perhaps there's opportunities for us to give webinars to your local associations 
or even to the State Association, or even come and give presentations as well. So we can talk about some presentation topics if you're interested in that. But uh, for the sake of time, we'll... Could, could you explain to me, because I someone did it for us, but how do you get a QR card? I know that being on site, so it's a thing, but is that specifically for you? Is, is there a cost for it? Or how do you get how do you get one of those things? Sure. Well, there are a lot of free services online, and that limits what you're able to do with them. The free services, you can generate a QR code, and that QR code will always be that QR code. They don't really allow much branding going on with it, color changes, logo integration, any of that sort of stuff. But you can generate any QR code and send it to a specific web address or URL. Um, you also have hosted services. Our company has a product that allows you to, uh, to put your logo in the center, so some branding associated with it. We allow you to track those QR codes through that platform, and we also allow you to redirect that QR code. So you can do variable marketing at a fixed cost. That company that put that QR code on a billboard, if you scan a QR code once and it brings you to a web page, and you scan it again and it brings you to the same web page, what are the odds you're going to scan it a third time? Probably not very good. And so by allowing you to change where that QR code points, you get a lot more bang out of the buck. And in fact, some of our realtor clients, they did what this one woman said, an oldie but a goodie. She sent out a magnet to all of her clients and said, scan each week for my newest listings. And every Sunday morning, she logs into our system over a cup of coffee and changes which properties that QR code is going to send people to. That way, there's a call to action every week. It's not a standing marketing system, you know, a standing piece of marketing. So, um, and I'll talk to you afterwards about that if you'd like to. Yeah, do they have to scan each time then? They have to scan the QR code each time. Each they have to scan the QR code, or they could just go to the person's website as well. And then the website. Website. So uh, just I'm going to kind of speed through these because the Google presentation is our primary focus today. Uh, but we've become a multi-screen society. People are spending different times on each type of device. We have 43 minutes for television, 39 minutes for a laptop, 30 minutes for a tablet, tablet, and 17 minutes per interaction on a smartphone. And that seems pretty high. But how <laughs> when they say that this is 17 minutes, you might send an email and put your phone down, but that doesn't mean you're done with your phone. Let's be honest. We're constantly picking it up, back and up. So average time is 17 minutes. So that's, that's pretty significant. Each type of these devices are used different ways. Computers are about keeping us productive and informed. 24% of our daily media interactions are on, uh, on a laptop. 69% uh, of this is at home. 31% is out in the world with their laptop. Smartphones are about keeping us connected. 38% of our interactions are with a smartphone on a daily basis. 60% actually is at home still, and 40% is on the road. And last but not least, tablets. Uh, with a mobile presence, uh, Mobiles primarily smartphones and tablets. Ebook readers fall into it as well, but ebook readers really don't have that much web traffic currently. So when you are creating mobile strategy, tablets are something to take into account because they are still coming to your website from, your tablet, or from those tablets um, regularly. But um, only 9% of our daily uh, interactions are on these devices. 21% of it is out of the house, 79% at home. But most importantly, people are using this for being entertained. If, so this is, that's an important consideration. If they associate your product, your website, with something that takes work, that isn't something that's fun or easy to use, they're never going to use it on a tablet. They're not going to be using it on their smartphone because it has to be easy for them to interact with. So that's just one more thing about why it's important to create a mobile strategy. Um, and the last is context drives the device choice. It, where you are, how much time you have, what the goal is, if you have a few minutes, and also the act, whatever your state of mind is at the time. So, uh, smartphones are the most common starting place for online activity. In fact, 65%, like I said at the beginning, 65% of all searches originate on a smartphone. That doesn't mean, but it's only 40% of all web traffic. So where is that difference? That means I've started it here, and now I'm going to my tablet. Or I've started it here, 
and now I want more information. Maybe I want to print something. So I go to my computer to do that. Um, so, in fact, 60% continue that to a PC, and only 4% continue that to a, uh, to a tablet. Then we have browsing the internet, shopping, planning a trip. Across the board, other than planning a trip, over 50% of online activity starts on a smartphone. Over 50%. So, those, those are really big numbers. For those of you who do not have a mobile strategy, whether it's for your association, whether it's for your business, um, both are extremely important things to take into account. Uh, PCs are more for starting complex act activities. If I want to send an email and I have the choice between my smartphone and my computer, it depends on how long that email is going to be. If I know that it's going to be more than a paragraph, I'm jumping on my laptop. It's going to take, it's going to take me three minutes as opposed to the five minutes. I mean, my thumbs aren't that big, but um, Sometimes I call them sausages because I mean it's it's not that easy to type on a phone, and that's another important consideration. Building a mobile presence, the more things people have to type in, the less likely they're going to continue using it on your mobile device. The last is tablets. Tablets are often the starting point for shopping and trip planning, but that's pretty much it. It's really small for the rest of the usage. Tablets are about entertainment. You're sitting, you're watching TV, you're also browsing, you know, playing around on the internet. You're looking at things. That's, and not always, I know many of you probably have a tablet in here and you're sending emails and you're, you're being as efficient as possible while you're at this event. But in general, your consumers, your clients or your members' consumers, this is how they're using the tablets. Consumers rely on the search to move between the devices too. How do I get from here to my laptop? here to my tablet. I'm not sending with one button the same website from here to my computer. In fact, Google is phasing that out. They had something that you could send the website you were currently looking on to your smartphone if you were using the same browser, the Chrome browser, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, but most people rely on Google search. I do, an, I do a search on here and I say, okay, I'm looking for new homes in Lemoyne. And then, I find what I'm looking for. How am I going to get back to that site when I'm at home? I'm going to my computer and I'm doing the exact same search. And I hope that you show up. The same that you did the first time on the mobile device. If you don't show up here and you show up on desktop, I didn't find you here first, so I'm not going to go to you now on desktop because I've already found the site that I'm working with. I've already found the company or the whatever firm that I'd like to use. So um, that's a very important <coughs> consideration, your search engine optimization. Uh, most of the time we use the screen that's closest. Well, that's not really true. 34% of the time we use the screen that's closest. The smartphone is always closest. Uh, I mean, I assume you pretty much always have it in your pocket, but only 34% of the time we use that. Um, on the road, obviously it's different where you are, but most of our daily interactions are at home. Let's keep that in mind. And last but not least, Yes, last but not least. Um, it's all about how people are using it. Spon uh, spontaneous usage for smartphones is 80%. Something pops into their head, this is where they go. They're not, you know, they're not waiting to get home once something popped into their head. Um, with laptops, only 52% of their usage is spontaneous. So it's planned activity. Uh, and so with your mobile marketing, if you have marketing that's out there in the world, um, if you have it on, let's say, uh, a sign at a, at a bus stop, or you have it in a newspaper that somebody picked up and they happen to be reading it out at a coffee shop, that means they're 